This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they... And I it felt, felt, felt this I this right. I was so and I just thought, well... I had figured it out. It was that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, welcome to the Story Clatter, where true personal stories about science help us to discover how weird and wonderful it is to exist in this world and be a human. I'm your host, Misha Gajewski, and today we're exploring the gross, the disgusting, the repulsive, the yucky. Both of our stories will probably make you go, ew, but then again, maybe not. What I love about disgust is that what one person finds gross might really appeal to someone else. And isn't that just the weird and wonderful reality of humans? Our first story is from Cassandra Hartley. Cassandra Hartley is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and an author. I love her story so much because it perfectly captures that awkward feeling of not knowing how to say no because you don't want to hurt someone's feelings or commit a social faux pas. It's so great. Here's Cassandra. I was a willful child. When I had the opportunity to play oboe instead of flute, I picked oboe because it's weird and hard. When I learned as a young child that meat comes from animals, I unilaterally became a vegetarian, much to the consternation of my poor working parents who did eat meat. And when I got to high school and everyone else signed up to take Spanish and French, I took Russian. And I wasn't very good at learning Russian. In fact, I had several C's mixed in with my usual A's. But over those four years of high school, I fell in love with the people and the culture and the weird history. And I decided that when I get to university, I was going to be a Russian major. My first week on campus in undergrad, I sign up for my Russian class, and I also find myself in a course called Introduction to Cultural Anthropology. And the professor, Dr. Weatherford, um, is an expert in Mongolia. He's done tons of fieldwork in rural Mongolia, and every week he brings out these interesting objects from his own fieldwork to illustrate the points he's trying to make in his lessons. So one day he's telling us about how you have to build rapport with the people you're doing ethnography with by accepting their hospitality and building goodwill. And he tells us a story about a time when he was sitting in a yurt with one of his hosts and they took a chunk of meat and they bit off the chunk of fat and plopped the chunk of fat into Professor Weatherford's little cup of salted milk tea. Because, of course, you have to give the best piece of meat to the guests. <laughs> now, Professor Weatherford was like, obviously in our society, that's disgusting. Uh, but in this culture, obviously I was being treated as the guest, so I smiled and thanked them and I ate the piece of fat. And he goes on to explain the concept of cultural relativism and the idea that when you step into another culture and try to understand it from the insider's point of view, you have to set aside your own ideas of what's good and bad or delicious and disgusting and really just accept the worldview of the people you're interviewing or working with. So he brings out the next object that's going to illustrate this lesson. And he goes to someone sitting down the aisle from me at the end of the aisle. And he says, "Uh, here's this little vessel and you can open it up and look inside. What do you think that is? You know, and the guy kind of looks at it and he's no idea. He's like, well, that's rendered horse fat and it's used as a lip balm. Try some. So, uh, you know. 
the guy declined, but he did kind of start to pass it down the aisle of the students as everybody was, um, you know, as he continued his lecture and it's coming toward me and it's getting closer and closer. And I'm thinking, am I the kind of person who's going to try the lip balm? Uh, on the one hand, uh, it's made of horse fat and I'm a staunch vegetarian. But on the other hand, I like weird hard things and I like getting good <laughs> grades. But also it's been in his office for maybe 10 years and everybody's been sticking their fingers in it. So when it gets to me, I kind of examine it and I observe the craftsmanship and I sniff it and I, I can't put my finger in it. I don't. I close the lid and I pass it on. So by the time I got to sophomore year, I was a double major in cultural anthropology and Russian studies. And what I wanted to do more than anything in the world was go on study abroad. I found the perfect program. It was a program uh, in Russia where you could do your own ethnographic field study that could turn into an honors project. Sign me up. What a nerd. <laughs> And no, this wasn't just in Moscow or St. Petersburg like every other program. No, no. I was going to rural Siberia. <laughs> so fast forward, it's the winter of 2005. I'm in the city of Irkutsk in southern Siberia with 10 other American undergraduate students. And we are living with host families. And every day we go to the university where we learn Russian language and culture and history. And uh, one of the big things that probably won't surprise you to hear is that in a group of 11 liberal arts college students, there were five vegetarians. <laughs> so uh, a lot of that chatter in the hallway was us whispering to one another, catching up, what did you guys have for dinner last night? How's your stomach? And trying to navigate our menu options for dinner in middling Russian uh, with our host families. And my host mother did one time prepare me a beautiful soup. And she proudly said, you know, it's vegetarian. There's no pork or beef. And I looked over her shoulder at the bubbling pot with a chicken bone on the stove. And I smiled and accepted my bowl and said, Spasibo, pulshoy, vkusna. Yes, thank you. It's so delicious. And I did my very best to finish my portion. So... Not long after that, uh, we were preparing for one of the big excursions of the study abroad program. We were going up into the mountains uh, with our whole group up high on the plains. And so we took an overnight train uh, and then a bus ride. And we we're going to a small village up in the high step near the border with Mongolia. And I was so excited. And the local tourism agents who met us were also really excited to have a group of 11 American young people because they thought it might help attract tourists to the region. So they planned us this amazing program. We met the local shaman. We learned a few words of Buryat, which is the name of the local language and ethnic group. And the final day was going to be a big tour of the local sites of the natural environment and a picnic. So we show up in the morning of the picnic, and there are two vans, uh, waiting for us. There are these big kind of Soviet style bread loaf vans. They're white with these giant craggy tires. And, uh, you know, we kind of split up half of the students in one mixed in with some locals who are coming on the picnic. Uh, so off we go. And the big tires are there for a reason because there are no roads in nomadic steppe regions. Uh, you just drive off and over some rocky terrain and through a creek and through a small forest and then off onto the steppe. And eventually we come to a place where the step kind of comes to a giant cliff and there's a beautiful river below and there's a little tree. There aren't a lot of trees on the step. There's a little tree and it has a bunch of prayer flags hanging on it. And we all get out of the vans and everybody says, you know, uh, let us tell you about our culture as Buddhist animist nomads when we come to a place where the river spirit meets the land spirit or the forest spirit meets the step spirit, we stop and we let go of our baggage and we reflect and we douse ourselves in holy water. And then he pulled out the bottle of really cheap vodka. <laughs> holy water. 
Um, so we all had a shot of vodka and chased it with a pickle and got back in the vans and kept driving. And I'm already thinking, this isn't the kind of picnic I was expecting. Um, and meanwhile, after the first shot, I realized that our driver is 16 years old and he's just gotten his license and we're driving along a cliff face, but he seems like he's got it under control. A few more stops later and we come to this lava field where there was like a very ancient volcano, but there's still volcanic rock on the ground. And I'm kind of kneeling down, just checking out like a little tipsy, uh, the rock with the moss growing on it. And uh, my friend Sienna, who had been riding in the other van, comes up to me and I'm like, oh, hey, she's got a kind of weird look on her face. And I'm like, oh, what's up? She starts talking in that whisper that lets you know that something intense is about to happen. And she's like, there's a sheep, a live sheep in the back of our van tied up. And when we get to the picnic, they're going to slaughter it and we are going to eat it. <laughs> and the wheels are turning in my head and I'm kind of thinking, uh, picnic, picnic, the words sound the same in Russian, but maybe they don't mean the same thing after all. Uh, I was thinking cheese, wine, grapes, live sheep slaughter. Okay. But she's still talking. And what Sienna is telling me is that I have been des designated with the task of telling every vegetarian in my van about the live sheep so that we can prepare ourselves and not act disgusted, but rather show gratitude for our hosts when we, uh, accept this sacrifice. So we get back in the vans, have a few more shots of holy water. I'm frantically whispering to uh, the people in my group without trying to let the hosting people know what we're talking about. And eventually we arrive at the picnic spot and it's beautiful. There is a nice blanket of yellow soft pine needles on the ground and a beautiful little babbling brook and they get to work uh, the locals get to work setting up a campfire and preparing some tea on the fire and then i see her the sheep she's uh you know woolly white uh <laughs> soft nose, weird square pupils in her kind eyes. And I know that she's about to die. And I realize, and all of my uh, classmates realize that now is the moment that we have to decide whether we're going to watch the sheep die or not. And I think to myself, and I remember Professor Weatherford's class, and I remember the lip balm, and I know I want to be an anthropologist, and I know I like hard things, and I'm like, I'm going to watch. So I stand there and I don't have any disgust on my face. I have pure reverence for the ceremony and the tradition of the people who are going to slaughter the sheep. And maybe I had reverence because I was experiencing it as a funeral. But <laughs> anyway, a lot of the meat eaters, strangely, were not watching. Uh, but, um, you know, what then happens is uh, the four strongest men each take a limb of the sheep and they hold her kind of splayed out uh, and and her chin also exposed and then she's kind of struggling but she kind of gives in when she realizes she can't fight it and then it turns out that the tradition is that the youngest man present our 16 year old driver is going to insert his hand into her open chest cavity while she's still alive and holding her heart determine when it stops beating uh, and I watching this happen, like a scene from Grey's Anatomy, as the other guys explain it uh, to him what he's going to do. And he looks really nervous. So I'm watching him as he holds her heart beating in his hand. And he looks really nervous, but he slowly starts to get a bit more calm. And then when her heart stops, he gives a nod and they slice her from her chin to her anus. And the women come over with a bit, couple vessels and a big giant ladle and they start ladling the blood out of the sheep. Uh, and I'm watching. And uh, 
And then they take the intestines out of the sheep. And let me tell you, sheep intestines are large. (laughs) There are a lot of intestines. It took a giant bowl that it took two women to carry. So I'm like, where are those intestines going? And I follow the intestines and they (laughs) keep walking and they're going further and further away with this giant plastic bowl of intestines. And then I see that what they're doing is they're actually going to empty all the excrement out of the intestines like hand over hand and there's a pile of sheep poop up to my thigh and it gets kind of grassy at the end actually half digested grass but then they start washing the intestines and um, they clean them and they mix the blood that they have saved with milk and onions that they have chopped and they make blood sausage and they put it in a big vat of water to boil And when they are adding the sausage to the pot, I realize that something else is happening and it's actually time to take the first bite of sheep. And the first bite of sheep is going to be a slice of raw liver dusted with salt on a slice of Soviet style sourdough bread. So we all gather in a big circle and I'm holding a plastic cup of holy water, AKA vodka in one hand and I'm already pretty drunk and I'm holding the slice of bread with raw sheep liver in the other hand and it sort of smells like wet and metallic. And then next thing I know, I'm taking a bite of the raw liver and I'm chewing and swallowing and chasing it with vodka. I ate the sheep. And then... I couldn't eat the second bite, so I handed it to my friend standing next to me and beseeched him to take it. And if I'm honest, I don't really remember much of what happened the rest of that adventure day, uh, probably because of the vodka, but (laughs) I did make it back to home eventually. And now whenever I think about how I became an anthropologist, I think about that sheep. That was Cassandra. To learn more about her or see some pictures from her Russian adventure, visit our website, storyclatter.org. Being a storyteller on our stage is just one way to make story clatter happen, but if standing alone in the spotlight in front of an audience doesn't speak to you, maybe becoming a story clutter donor might be more your speed. Story clutter donors play a vital role in our ability to bring you this podcast. We're in this together. Story clutter is one big experiment that's designed to connect us around our love of discovery, curiosity, and the natural world. If you believe in the power these stories have in this mission, please donate to the Story Clutter at storyclutter.org slash donate. The most popular level is $10 a month, and you can make your tax-deductible donation at storyclutter.org slash donate. But really, any level makes a difference, and we're so grateful to everyone who supports Story Collider. Misha here. If you enjoy our episodes on career pathways in healthcare or the STEM field at large, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, the same team behind the acclaimed A16Z podcast. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with venture capital investors and A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. So whether you're interested in building a new digital healthcare company or your company is advancing a new novel medicine, Raising Health sheds light on some of the opportunities and obstacles along the founder's journey. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights, actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and tell them I sent you. Our next story is from Jenny Kleeman. Jenny is a journalist, broadcaster, and author who just published her second book, The Price of Life, this month. Her story was recorded at Imperial College London last year. Jenny's story is so relatable for all of us who've ever contemplated going vegan. Also, if you've ever wanted to know what a lab-grown chicken tastes like, this story gives you a very, very good idea. Spoiler, Jenny isn't a fan. Here's Jenny. Jenny. 
so I'm here to tell you about a time pretty much five years ago to the day exactly when I was in a converted chocolate factory in San Francisco, sitting at a counter with lots of people staring at me, holding in my hand the most special chicken nugget in the world. And I had flown halfway across the world to have this chicken nugget in my hands. It had taken about 15 or 20 emails to get anywhere near this chicken nugget, and it was a priceless chicken nugget. Or rather, they wouldn't tell me exactly how much it cost, except it was probably at least $1,000, this chicken nugget. And uh, not many people in the world had ever got to taste it. This was no ordinary chicken nugget. It was chicken, but not chicken as we know it, because the chicken inside this nugget had not been grown on the body of a chicken. It had been grown in a laboratory. I'm going to tell you how you do this here. You take a biopsy from a live chicken. Don't have to kill it. You could give it a little anaesthetic first. You get a little sesame seed sized bit of their flesh. You isolate the stem cells, you bathe it in a nutrient bath. I realize I'm sounding like a scientist here, but I'm, I'm not, I'm a journalist. And uh, you put it in a bioreactor and it proliferates. One cell becomes two, two cells become four, four become eight, and so on, until you've grown enough chicken, enough meat to harvest and cook and eat. And back then in 2018, this was pretty radical stuff. Very few people had got to taste it. And this meat was being touted as the savior of planet Earth. And I really wanted it to be the savior of planet Earth because I loved meat. I really loved meat. Uh, for me, meat made a meal, and particularly steak, which is the kind of most ethically dubious of all meat. Steak and lamb are both pretty bad, but steak for me, that was the big thing to have. That was the celebration food. When my husband asked me to marry him, he cooked me a steak afterwards. It's what we might have on my birthday. I do love a steak. Uh, but I know that meat as we know it is completely unjustifiable. The industrialized uh, creation of meat for global consumption is appallingly terrible for the planet. It's terrible for our bodies. And it's terrible for animals. Uh, 17 billion animals are killed every year because we think they're tasty, not because we need to eat them. Uh, we can survive being vegan if we want to. We can take supplements. We can have a balanced diet without meat. We don't have to eat meat. Uh, so this little, tiny little beige thing I was holding in my hand promised me that uh, I could have meat with a clean conscience. I could have my steak and eat it. Because also you can make any kinds of meat out of this stuff as well. You can make uh, kosher bacon. You can make foie gras with a clear conscience. So I was really, really up for it. And I was surrounded by PR people in this startup and they're all watching me and I'm about to bite into this thing. And it's small because it's very expensive. And I'm there as a journalist knowing that I'm really lucky to have this. And I'm not a food critic, and I've been reading on the plane over all about how to be a food critic and what you should think about and the notes that you should take. And I re realized I was only really going to get like three or four bites out of this little thing. But the time had finally come. So I bit into it, and it tasted like chicken. I mean, it was chicken. I don't know what I was expecting it to taste like, but it tasted like chicken. It had that unmistakable aroma of chicken on my tongue in my nose, this was chicken. It was great. And I smiled, I was so happy. And they said, what do you think? And I said, I taste like chicken. <laughs> and then I took another bite and I chewed. And gradually as I chewed, I realized that it was completely disgusting. <laughs> because whilst it tasted like chicken and it was chicken, there were no discernible pieces of flesh in this chicken nugget. This was not chicken, as, as you know it, as I know it. This was not meat. This was chicken cells in a kind of mush, in a mash, bulked out with something and then coated with some kind of batter and deep fried. This was not proper chicken. And there was some sort of hind part of my brain, this primordial part that I think we've evolved to have as human beings that keeps us alive. When you eat something that is like meat but not quite right, and your brain is telling you, no, 
you must not swallow this because it is going to poison you. You must spit this out. But I'm surrounded by all these PR people. <laughs> and they've, I've flown across the world. And this is a very expensive chicken nugget. So I, I don't spit it out. And I think they must have seen something in my face because one of them said, any other feedback? You know, we take all comments. And I said, it's a bit mushy. But um, in one respect, the chicken nugget was a great success because it did turn me vegan for a full four days. I could not eat any meat because the memory, the kind of backwash of this horrific, mushy, mushy chicken came back into my head. Anyway, I came home and I started writing the book that I was writing, which is called Sex, Robots and Vegan Meat, the vegan meat being the lab-grown meat and uh, the nugget. And writing books is a lonely business. Uh, you go out and you do the reporting and then you come home and you're kind of scowling in front of your computer all day. And I always look forward to the evenings where my husband would come home and we'd have dinner and I'd talk about what I was writing about. And when I was writing the section of the book, which is about how meat is indefensible, as we know it, industrial agriculture, I'd read a lot of scientific papers and was really shocked by the extent of how bad things are and wanted to share it with him. And so uh, we have a kind of uh, sort of kitchen island where you can cook. And he was cooking dinner, and I was sitting up at the kitchen island next to him. And I was saying, you know that industrial agriculture produces more greenhouse gases than every form of transport on the planet combined. And he said, well, that doesn't mean I should eat less meat. <laughs> and I said, well, why? how can you say that? And he said, well, you know, carbon capture. They're going to invent something that will suck all that stuff out of the sky. That doesn't, it's, no, it's not a reason to eat less meat. And I said, OK, well, did you know that, like, when it comes to antibiotics, you remember when I had tonsillitis and I wouldn't go to the doctor for antibiotics because we're all being told you mustn't get them unless you're dying because of medicine-resistant, uh, you know, horrible bugs that are learning how to beat the antibiotics that you've really got to ration them. Well, 80% of all of the antibiotics in the world are given to animals that aren't even sick. They dose them up so that they can stand in their own shit next to each other, flank by flank, and so we can eat them cheaply. And he said, that's just a problem with government policy, isn't it? It's not, nothing to do with meat. They should just stop people giving this meat to animals, I mean, giving these antibiotics to animals. And I couldn't quite believe it. And I was like, well, what, you know, what about the fact that, you know, meat is a major cause of deforestation? What about pollution of water, waste of water, waste of energy, E. coli, salmonella, pandemics, pandemics? And he just didn't want to hear it at all. In fact, he just said, I don't want to talk about it, as he tipped the beef into the casserole dish, <laughs> making his famous chili. And I was sitting there and thinking why my totally rational but very kind of stubborn husband, he's a builder, by the way, he's a very manly, chunky husband, why he would be taking this all so personally, because he did seem to be taking it personally. We get on very well, and he would say he just didn't want to hear it. And then I realised it's because meat is actually more than food. Meat is culture, really. And for human beings, for many human beings, meat is about our dominance over the animals, our mastery of the world. It's about killing and manliness. And I think maybe he was worried that if I was swallowing all these arguments about why it wasn't OK to eat meat, he would have to swallow them too. And that would maybe make him a little bit less of a manly man. And he didn't really want to hear it at all. So we didn't talk about it again. And here we are, five years later. The chicken nugget that I ate, the mushy nugget, was the first lab-grown meat ever to go on sale. It went on sale in uh, 2021 in a private members club in Singapore. I think they cost about $50 each, so not exactly saving the world. The thinking about lab-grown meat has also changed too. Uh, it's no longer being touted as the savior of the planet. It may be uh, less carbon producing to eat a, a lab-grown beef burger uh, than beef from a cow, but when it comes to chicken, the jury is still out. And actually, the best way, if you're going to eat meat, the best thing to eat is uh, insects, because it's very good for the planet if you eat insects. So if that's what's uh, driving your food choices, you know what to eat. Um, 
This year, the FDA in the US approved lab-grown meat for the first time. So very soon, it's going to be all over American shopping markets. You can buy it everywhere if you want to. I'm sure it must be better than what I ate five years ago. It has to be better. I think it's still quite expensive. And as for me, well, I really don't eat meat very much anymore. I certainly never have it before dinner. We'll never have any meat at all with my lunch. Certainly no fry-ups for breakfast either. I only eat it a few times a week because that's the thing. You don't have to be a vegan to save the planet. You can just eat a little bit less and make sure that the meat you eat um, counts. And the meat that I eat does count because they are meals that I share with my very manly husband who has not changed his diet at all in any way whatsoever. Uh, one thing though for me is completely off the menu for the rest of my life and that's Chicken nuggets. I'm never going to eat one of them again. Thank you. <laughs> that was Jenny. To learn more about her, head to our website, storyclatter.org. Our website is just one way to connect with Story Clatter, but there are so many other ways, and we hope you'll use them all. You can always follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Head to storyclatter.org to become a financial supporter. Or if you want to come to one of our shows or start your own Story Clatter show in your community, you can learn all about that on our website, too. This podcast is produced by me, Misha Gajewski, along with Nikisha Roberts-Washington, Jen Chen, and Aaron Barker, executive director and co-founder of The Story Clatter. The stories featured in today's episode were produced by Sarah Missouri, Michaela Agapiu, Richard Kemeny, and me, Misha Gajewski. Special thanks goes out to Story Collider's board and staff, including Anne-Marie Lonsdale, Leslie Burnson, and Lindsay Cooper. Our theme music is by Ghost, and next week's episode is all about that motivation that drives us to do what we do. Until next time, thanks for listening. Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Greedy corporate mega stores, led by Walmart and Target are pushing for a law in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. The Durbin Marshall credit card bill would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, tell your lawmakers, hands off my rewards. Tell them to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill.